Hello and welcome to the National Maritime Museum as we celebrate Women's History Month. This is the second part of Rebel Women, Female Pirates. I'm Elma, your host, and with Shahira this evening, our Zoom queen, who is providing all the tech support, keeping her eye on the chat as we navigate our course this evening. I'd like to take a moment um, just to thank all of you who Zoomed in last week. It was great to read your comments in the chat and all the lovely email messages that we received from all many parts of the world. I see Vancouver's in tonight, uh, lovely. Um, and it's really useful feedback. Um, there definitely seems to be an appetite for female pirate history. And, and on that note, can I just add that you can contribute by adding a, or giving a donation to support the future work of the museum via the link, which here we'll put up in the chat box. Um, and just use the reference female pirates if you do donate. With your help, we will continue to deliver well-being and learning programs such as this at a time when we realize how much society needs arts, culture and education. So it's time to away anchor and set sail for tonight's historical voyage, concentrating in the main on a pirate queen, Grace O'Malley, also known as Grania Whale. And joining me to discuss Grace and women in combat are Anne Chambers. Anne is a biographer, she's a novelist and screenplay writer, author of 10 biographies, including the best-selling Grace O'Malley, the biography of Ireland's pirate queen, 1530 to 1603. And Anne is the catalyst for the restoration of Grace O'Malley to political, social and maritime history. Also joining us is uh, Dr. Julie Wheelwright. She's the author of several historical books. Her most recent publication is Sisters in Arms, Women Warriors from Antiquity to the New Millennium. Welcome both. Thank you very much, Emma, lovely to be with you. And lovely to see you both. Thank you for joining us. Um, Anne, can we start with you this evening? Yes. All right, great. So, Grown Your Whale, there's a lot to unpack. How and when did you come across Grace O'Malley? Well, Elma, uh, I'm from the west of Ireland, and uh, on our annual summer holidays uh, around the Clue Bay area, I heard all the legends and all the folklore about Grace O'Malley. And yet when I went to school, she never appeared in my school history books. So that got me wondering, was she one of the legends of Ireland, like the great Queen Maeve, the warrior Queen of Connacht, or did she really exist? And fast forward to a career in the Central Bank of Ireland and uh, a very well-known uh, public servant here, Dr. Ken Whittaker, whose biography actually I ended up writing uh, as well. So he, he put me on the path and he said, why don't you do it now? So in my early 20s, I took on the extraordinary task, really, um, a bit inexperienced myself, I had. I hadn't lived my life. I was really only starting out. And to take on this complex, experienced woman uh, took me four years to find her. And here we are, all these years later, still talking about her. Wow. Um, and how did she come? Because I know, like, your story to say is similar um, in terms of hearing about Grace O'Malley or hearing about Brawny Whale when I was going to school when I was young in Ireland. And I also heard a Maeve as well. And I thought she was just part of folklore. You know, you just hear some stories. So how did she come to be virtually written out of history? Well, there's a very good reason, really, as I found out. I didn't know these questions either until I set out on my own voyage of discovery. Firstly, we have to examine the time of Grace O'Malley. The 16th century in Irish history tends to be overlooked for a very good reason. There's no flag wa waving in the 16th century. It was an age that really was the most traumatic in all the history of Ireland. And because there's no great ideological movement that really is pu pushing the people to act the way they did, including Grace O'Malley, it tended to be overlooked. And secondly, as well, you know, women in history tend to get airbrushed. And while later generations of Irish historians and analysts wanted to create the image of Gaelic womanhood to be dutiful wives, very charitable, very good living. Now, 
no matter how one would try, you couldn't fit Grace O'Malley into that role. So it was much easier for her to be airbrushed. And uh, maybe a third reason was the sea. The sea is what sets Grace O'Malley apart from every other female le leader in the history of the world, really. And really, even today, you know, for all our liberalization and all the uh, advancement women have accomplished over the six centuries, you know, the sea is still a bit of a barrier us women you know it still is the kind of the place that we don't go to except on our holidays for example but to make a living from it is very different so these were the reasons that she was written out of Irish history. I mean Ireland had been a matriarchal culture during the Bronze Age um, but like did the demise as well come um, with the with Christianity and Roman law as well? Is that part of it? Absolutely. You know, Grace O'Malley is a link between the great warrior queens of Ireland. Even the name Ireland is named after a woman, Eru, the famous uh, warrior woman. We also have of Dana, we also have to come to Grace O'Malley. So she's a throwback really to that matriarchal culture that was there uh, about 1,500 years before her. Does she sort of represent the end of the line of powerful women in Ireland? Well, you know. Yes, she does. She does really, you know, after that, you mentioned their Roman law, you know, Roman law came to Ireland, also it brought Christianity and both sadly were very detrimental to women. Now, uh, when Grace O'Malley was born in 1530, Ireland was ruled by what was known by a, a legal system known as the Breton Laws. Now, the Breton Laws were very liberal to women in comparison to the common law of England, for example, and indeed to, to um, legal ethos on the continent. For example, Grace O'Malley inherited land from her own mother which is quite extraordinary and kept it because her son had it many, many decades later. Also, Grace O'Malley kept her own name. She never assumed the name of Flaherty or Burke from her two husbands. And thirdly, she had this extraordinary independent life that she lived even as a single person, a woman, but also during the course of her two marriages. Right. So... The, the O'Malley's, the family, they were very, well, they were very unusual because Ireland didn't produce many seafaring families um, and they derived their li living mostly from the sea. How, how was she raised? We know she was, they were quite wealthy. What do we know about her childhood? Well, firstly, Grace O'Malley belongs to Gaelic aristocracy. We forget that. We don't often use the word aristocracy in relation to republics, you know, but they, if, if <laughs> culture had its aristocracy and the Gaelic aristocracy she was the daughter of a chieftain. Now to talk about the O'Malley's, the O'Malley's go back in history, back 2000 years, always associated with the sea. The sea was in Grace O'Malley's DNA. Indeed if Grace O'Malley was born a boy, we possibly wouldn't be talking about her tonight. You know, she'd be just another O'Malley doing what came naturally. Their clan motto, terra marique potens, powerful by land and sea. In all the ancient islands of Ireland, the O'Malley's are always mentioned with the sea. They're mentioned as, they're called by the Gaelic poets, the lions of the green ocean, you know, and all their various enterprises which included a little bit of piracy and plundering, like most maritime communities. Um, you know, it's always associated with the sea. So, as I say, Grace, the sea was in Grace O'Malley's DNA. She was married quite early, like she was married at 15, which probably was regular back then. Um, she had three children, I believe. Um, you wouldn't think she'd have time for anything else, really, but what age did she first begin to swash her buckle at? at sea and where was she plundering like who were her targets okay well grace o'malley's first marriage was an arranged marriage because she was the daughter of a chieftain her marriage had to pay, pay political dividends to her clan as well as to her immediate family so she was married off in an arranged match which would have been normal indeed it would be normal for people in england of that of an aristocratic uh, uh, background the same on the continent and she was married to a guy called Donal O'Flaherty now he also had 
the pen name of On Coggy, which means in Irish, off the battles. So you can imagine what kind of a young tear away he was. And I really have to say he belonged to the Gaelic chieftains of 16th century who could never get their act together, really. It was inter <laughs> clan feuding. You can, rem you can remember it also in Scotland during Braveheart, all these... Uh, chieftains who did nothing on a inter-clan warfare, which of course the Tudors took advantage, the Tudor armies took advantage of uh, later on. But her first marriage was, uh, she moved from the area around Clube, her father's old territory of uh, the barony of Mursk, and she moved over to Connemara, over towards Ballycanely, Ballinahinch area, and there her husband also had the O'Flaherty's had a smaller uh, um, business on the sea than the O'Malley, so she was quite at home in that area. But it would seem to have been a rather, let's say, uh, unsatisfactory marriage from her point of view, because her young chieftain husband didn't particularly like an independent wife. Oh. So she played the beautiful wife, and she had three children, Owen, Murrock, and a daughter named Margaret, who was named after her own mother. Okay. Um, so, um, like, who, who were her targets when she was off on the sea? Who were they targeting? Okay, well, we have to have a look at the wild west coast of Ireland. You know, it was in 16th century, as it is today, despite all our technical advantages, there are always uh, fatalities along the sea. It was a very, very difficult uh, coastline to navigate. Um, and... The, because she had that experience from her family, when she, her first husband died, she returned to her father's uh, uh, land. Now, she says to Queen Elizabeth later on that her first husband withheld, her first husband's family withheld her dowry uh, on her uh, when she left. So that shows you that she was pressed now to do something for herself and her three children. And this is where the image and the fable and the folklore around the great pirate queen comes into being. Because Clare Island, anybody who knows that beautiful bay, uh, Clue Bay with its 300 islands, and Clare Island stands like a sphinx at the, at the, at the mouth of the bay. And there she set herself up as an independent businesswoman, really. And she made use of what she had. She had a great knowledge of sea and seafaring. Now, in every community that is a maritime community, be it Cornwall or the South China Seas, a little bit of plundering and piracy always accompanied the more legitimate trading that went on in maritime families. And the O'Malley's were no exception. There are reference to them having a, the odd little plunder up off Scotland, down around Ulster, down as far as Munster. And Grace O'Malley did the same thing. But she did one extra thing that they hadn't thought about. Galway City was a very big emporium for the importation of goods and particularly wine from Spain at the time. And it made very rich pickings. So she figured that her father's sea territory, if she had to pay very high taxes to trade in Galway, which the Irish clans had to do, she said, well, let's put tolls on the ships that sail through our sea waters. And when I say our sea waters, they were very, very fertile waters because the O'Malley's main trade was in salted fish which they exported to Spain. So they were very well used of this connection with Spanish. But Grace O'Malley added that little extra quiver to her bow and went on the toll taking. And indeed, an army was sent at one stage out of Galway. The merchants of Galway City actually sent an army against her, but she managed to turn the tide on them. So she sounds like she was skillful. She was tactical. She was daring. I um, mean, if she could extract a living from the Atlantic seaboard, because we know that it's fairly treacherous seas around there. They're not easy. Um, so it was no mean feat back in the 16th century to be commander of a ship of pirates, um, exclusively a male domain. D did she have to dress up as a man or but she didn't have to pretend to be a man? Well, now, uh, the Atlantic Oceans ain't the Pirates of the Caribbean, as we all know. It's <laughs> rough territory over there on the sea. For a woman's physique, the seafaring in the 16th century must have been absolutely terrible. 
Her galleys, which are noted in the English state papers, could carry up to 200 men uh, uh, on each, aboard each ship. You know, were clinker built wooden, they were, they were sailed with a Latin sail, which gave them great mobility, and were rowed with 30 oars on either side. These are the description given off our ships in the state papers, not mine. Now, to be in command of 200 men sounds very maybe easy today with all the women who are heading up great financial corporations and great businesses. But just think again what I said about how Ireland was politically divided into around 40 different clans, each with their inter-clan feuds and, and grudges going on. That Grace O'Malley managed to take men from many different clans in the west of Ireland and mold them into an army of over 200 men. She only, she only admits to having 200 men for tactical reasons to the English. Okay. How she did that, it shows that firstly, she had to be successful. No men, men would follow, and particularly not a woman, by sea if she wasn't successful. No pay, no pay, was the old classic saying for anything to do with the sea. Secondly, I think she had to have some special charisma that kept these men enthralled to her and loyal to her until the end of her very, very long life. So also she had to be better than they were at seafaring. Otherwise, they would not have followed her. So you have the image now of Grace O'Malley coming out of that. I did say to you that she lived in a remote area of Ireland at the oh. West Coast, but we landlubbers always look on the sea as a barrier. But Grace O'Malley to Grace O'Malley and every mariner, it was a highway. It was a highway to new fashions, new goods, new markets, new languages, new cultures. But more importantly, it was also a great peddler of gossip, the sea. And, information. and she mightn't have had information technology at her hand, but she had the sea, which was a great uh, bringer in of information and that stood her in great stead down the road when she had to make her great voyage to where we're bringing her back tonight to Greenwich. Right and like as you said that she kind of maintained that over 40 years which is incredible. <laughs> It is incredible. It's incredible, really. You know, her great contemporary, Queen Elizabeth I, in another way, was very, very similar. Against all the odds, she held on to her throne for the same time. It's very, uh, it's very, uh, I suppose, fitting that both women were in power at the same time and did meet then eventually towards the end of their lives. But for Grace O'Malley, really, it was far more difficult. You know, you, we, we, the pirate queen element of Grace O'Malley sometimes I feel overshadows her totally. We have to think of her also as a woman. She was a daughter. She was a wife twice over. She was the mother of four children. She was a divorcee. I think also she was the lover. She was a grandmother and she was a great grandmother as well as becoming a matriarch. So she fulfilled all the rules of womanhood. You know, still was that career woman. And that's why I think today she is so relevant to women today who have to do both, you know, keep the home fires burning and also make a living. And Grace O'Malley is the great iconic example of that. So she's essentially one very astute, like kick-ass woman, like as well as being a chieftain, a commander of pirates. There's also other stories, and I don't know how true they are, that she's a bit of a gambler. As you said, she married a couple of times and had lovers. And I also read she kidnapped a child. So, and some of the stories make me feel like you wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of her. Like she mm. would get back at you if you did anything to her. Um, but, so um, but, I also read somebody, that, go on, sorry. Somebody once asked me on that, Elma, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> I did meet Grace O'Malley, what would I do? I said, I'd possibly go to the other side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think you'd have a good drink with her and she'd have, she certainly had a few stories. Um, but there was also one I read that she gave birth uh, during a battle at sea and like, I don't know, I guess she swaddled the newborn, stashed it somewhere and then she leapt back into battle. Um, so I'm guessing female pirates didn't have maternity leave. But is that a true story? Well, 
as a biographer, you know, I had to go back to the factual documents. And without the English state papers, we would know no factual details about Grace O'Malley. Now, she, her memory was kept alive from fireside to fireside here in Ireland over 400 years, which in effect itself proves what an impact she made on her time, that her memory at least was kept. And I told you that the historians and analysts airbrushed her out of history. Without the English state papers, we wouldn't know anything about her. It was the perceived enemy that recorded events on Grace O'Malley's life. Mm. Now, she, you know, she had to, you asked me that question there, sorry, um, about a baby, about fighting, was it? Her son was born uh, aboard her ship, and that was always one of the strongest folklore tales, and that her ship was attacked the day after the birth by Algerian pirates. And I found conclusive evidence of that in an old Latin document to say, yes, her son was born aboard her ship. And of course, the Barbary Coast pirates actually made incursions all along the south and west coasts of Ireland at that time. So there again, you have folklore and fact coinciding. You know, folklore has preserved that, thankfully. And then someone like me, a biographer, goes off into official papers and you say, oh, my goodness. There's that story that we all thought was somebody met down the road, and here is the conclusive proof. And that is, I have had so many uh, examples of that during the course of the four-year research for Grace O'Malley. It was quite extraordinary. You know, I, I got access to a private collection of papers held in the home of her then 13th great grandson in descent in Westport House, and they had never been opened before. And I was... For the first time since the authors put quill to parchment, opening up these documents for the first time. And I can tell you, Elma, that was really one of the highlights, yes. Oh, I imagine. I mean, yeah. you, so you've been like, since you were in your early 20s, researching her, checking all this stuff out for us. Um, what, was there any one thing like at the end of it? I know you're not even at the end of it, but because there's lots more to go on, Grace, but... um. Like, was there one thing that you felt about her or even just finding her story that, you know, resonates? With well, you? firstly, I was delighted to, you see, it started me off as a child when she was written out of history and I didn't see her in my school history books. Now I get thousands of letters and emails through her website from people, from children all over the world at all yeah. levels education to say now she is being looked at as a factual hist historical figure and that to me is perhaps the greatest thing I have taken from that that what started me out on my journey now thankfully hopefully through the book and for like programs like this and all the other things that have been done about her that now she is being looked at and in this day and age when women want you know to see inspirational women in the past I think she's there with the best of them really Really. And she can show us that in a traumatic background, and we haven't really touched too much really on the political and social situation that she had to contend with. It was absolutely ter terrible. You think of Syria today and you're coming quite close to it. So she had to put up and operate, look after her children, look after her husbands, and you know, be the woman she was, and she managed to survive and do it into old age. It's she still leaves me a bit breathless, actually. There's um, I just see a question here from Gail Hunt. Um, were the two hundred men press ganged, or did they go willingly to see life? Uh, nobody would be press ganged. I think would would stick the wild Atlantic Ocean. There were a loyal crew to her. She talks about them in in the state papers, and they stayed with her to the very very end. Indeed, some of them went to London with her for her for her meeting with the Queen. So at this stage, um, we're going to sort of look at her next bit of her life because there was a few bumps on the road, mm. um, and England. I think was really into Ireland at this stage. They couldn't get enough of it. So um, I'm wondering, like, how did she come to be imprisoned? What happened? Well, she, she was, 
imprisoned really the first imprisonment was by the uh, great earl of desmond one of the uh, the uh, gaita sized lords here in ireland at the time and she went on a plundering mission down to county limerick and it was the only time she was caught actually and it was by the earl of desmond and his loyalty to queen elizabeth was under suspicion he was in cahoots actually with philip ii of spain and to keep the english from his door down in askeaton castle he handed this great pirate queen over to the English authorities who promptly put her into Dublin Castle, which was the, the prison for the most, uh, the most important political prisoners at the time. And she spent a full year there. Mm -hmm. And that was imprisonment. Now, how she got out, very few people, no more than the Tower of London, very few people or prisoners got out of there. And we don't really know how she did it. But I think her husband set up a rebellion in Mayo at the time. And she must have said to uh, the English Lord Deputy, well, look, I bring him to heel if you let me out. But she didn't. She actually went into rebellion three times and led a private army against one particular English administrator, Sir Richard Bingham, who really and truly did get the better offer, you know, uh, and he was terrible, really, in many ways. And it was through him that she's making her 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 voyage down the yellow brick road to Greenwich, because it was Bingham who firstly killed her eldest son, Owen O'Flaherty. Mm -hmm then actually uh, imprisoned her half-brother and also imprisoned her beloved son who was born aboard her ship, who was the unfortunate name of Theobald, but we know him in Ireland as Tibbet Nalong, Toby off the ships. So you have Grace O'Malley, not, it's not all a plain sailing for Grace O'Malley by any means. It's, you know, she is now being buffeted by what is happening in Ireland. And what is happening in Ireland at the time is the, the Tudor conquest of Ireland is happening. It begins at the beginning of her life by persuasion, and it ends then as... Spain begins to use Ireland as a backdoor to England, Philip II of Spain. The, the urgency then is turned into a really frightful military takeover of the Gaelic chieftains. And we come back to these headless chickens again because they couldn't see the bigger picture and they never got together and united under one leader. But each one of them were picked off one by one by the incoming English military administration and were bought off indeed on in many occasions. So you had this awful disunity. So survival became the main uh, spur for everybody. How to survive this maelstrom that is now descended on Ireland. It's terrible. Scorched earth pol uh, policy was, was enforced. You know, you have murder of her, of her eldest son. You have all of this happening. and. You know, you can go and see where piracy comes into this. Look at Somalia today. Mm. It was often a symptom of political disorder and unrest on land. You know, and you can see Grace Somali more and more now towards the end of that century to protect herself and her family. She's going more to the sea all of the time. So it's all been 1593 when she decides she has to do something about this. Okay, so we're getting near, not the end of her story, but she, her meeting with Queen Elizabeth I. And I'm just being mindful of time there, but yeah. So can you tell us what happened when she met the Queen and why was she meeting the Queen? Okay, well, Grace O'Malley uh, had reached, was pushed into a corner by Bingham. He had uh, actually had imprisoned her as well and, and uh, brought a gallows. She even talks about that. I'm just, was looking at it today in one of her letters to uh, Elizabeth. But when Bingham took her youngest and beloved son and put him in prison on a trumped up charge for treason, which of course meant, meant execution, Grace O'Malley knew that there was nobody left in Ireland to help her. And had the political acumen to know how to get to the Queen. Now, today, you don't go knocking on Buckingham Palace and want to see Queen Elizabeth II. You have to go through certain procedures, protocols. Wow. It is the great political knowledge and acumen of Grace O'Malley that she knew how to do that. Firstly, she got a letter of introduction from the Queen's favourite Lord, who happened to be an Irish man called Black Tom, Earl of Ormond. You can imagine him quite a swashbuckler in his day. <laughs> she knew him. Yeah. He found the little letter of introduction in the state papers that Black Tom gave this now rebel, now pirate, 
a, a protection pass to get to London. Secondly, she got the ear of the great William Cecil, Lord Burley, uh, Queen Elizabeth's most trusted Secretary of State, who had been with Elizabeth for so many years throughout her life, protecting her. And I found one of, Eliz of Grace O'Malley's letters to Lord Burley, and I see where he started doodling on the side of it, this great statesman, and he was trying to work out Grace O'Malley's lineage. She has her married to Donal on Coggy, then married to her second husband, Richard, and all the children. So she's building up this. So she sailed off to London under the protection of the Earl of Ormond and was around the town of London for about three months until 1593 when Burley arranged for her to meet Grace in appropriately enough for tonight in Greenwich Palace, in the old palace of Greenwich. And I have to say, I climbed the same stairs there that they told me in Greenwich was still the landing stage that Grace O'Malley would have gone up the steps from her galley up wow. to me, Elizabeth. So wow. it's the things that make a biography's life. <laughs> I bet. Um, and just to finish on this bit on Grace for now, what would you say Grace's relevance is? I mean, you have touched on it, but her relevance for women today, and given that yesterday was Independent Women's Day as well. Yeah, well, I think this international focus, you know, on things like gender equality, um, you know, uh, female empowerment, and also, may, may I add, we all hope so as well, on female ageing. You know, Grace O'Malley is still active in her late 60s, which today would be like in some, a woman in their late 90s, because the average life expectancy in the 16th century was much lower, of course. And I think she's that inspirational person for us women today, trying to balance out our life, trying to be fulfilled in her life. I think she was a very, very a fulfilled woman in terms of her career, in terms of her family, in terms perhaps even of her love life, who's to know really for sure. But she certainly had a very, very good second husband, even though they say she divorced him and possibly did, was allowable through Brehan Law, but they did get together again. And she managed to, to get him to be the head honcho in Connacht under the MacWilliam title. And they were a very, very powerful couple but I think it's that inspirational icon that we all need and I think Grace O'Malley fits that bill. She certainly does and more besides I think um, just seen somebody there saying they are buzzing what a great woman Grace O'Malley was um, someone in Ireland I think. Um, thank you Anne if we can go over um, listen we'll put some questions we'll put your questions to <clears throat> Anne and Julie um, at the end uh, but right now we'll go over to Julie. Um, so your book, Sister in Arms, which is up for award, congratulations. It, it kind of demonstrates that women have always played a key role as warriors. Can you expand that and tell us about the recent findings of warrior remains? Okay, well, the first thing that I'd like to do is um, to thank Anne for the many wonderful points that she made. I mean, thank you so much for mentioning older women because I too have been working on this since my twenties and I am now gray haired and um, just turned 60 this year. And I wanted to just share something with you about um, International Women's Day because I came to London in 1985. I was a young uh, postgraduate student and I had come from Toronto where we were always used to having a parade and, and International Women's Day being sort of as, you know, the city was alive with all kinds of feminist events. And I was asking around saying, where's the parade? And everyone looked at me completely <laughs> dumbfounded. It didn't exist. So here we are and we've got these, these wonderful events going on and I'm so delighted to be part of this. Okay, so back in the, back in the 1980s when I started um, researching this, um, I came across the notion of um, uh, the Amazons, you know, and so the myth of the Am Amazons was, of course, that they were warrior women, that they, um, that they rode on horseback, that they lived um, only exclusively amongst women, you know, these are sort of stories from antiquity. But in the 1990s, there were, there were women who were beginning to go back to the tombs in the area around the Black Sea, um, and do these excavations and the female skeletons buried um, with male skeletons 
you know, there were swords, there were whetstones, there were all sorts of bits of equipment that belonged to uh, military warfare. And the assumption was that all of those things belonged to the men, belonged to the male skeletons. And the advance in forensic um, technology enabled these archaeologists to determine that, that the, the, the wounds that they were finding on the skeletons, the female skeletons, matched those of the male, which led them to the conclusion that actually these women, these Scythian women in this area around the Black Sea, were also warriors. And there's been some wonderful work done by um, an archaeologist by the name of Adrian Mayer, who's actually um, dug into this in great detail and found that the myth of the Amazons comes from the Greeks, of course, because what they did was they heard these stories of these remarkable women warriors. They were on horseback, they had swords, um, they went after the men, and who they really were were this group of women who were raised, the girls were raised in the same way that the boys were. They were dressed in similar clothing. They were trained um, to ride on horseback. They were given weapons training. And this is the root of the myth because the Greeks saw these women from a distance and could not believe that they were human beings. So they turned them into goddesses. And I love that story. And that story is so central and so important because you know, going back to revisit all of this material from my recent book, what I discovered was that time and again throughout the centuries, you have references to these mythical women. And it's almost as if, and of course, it's men writing, writing these stories largely, and they just simply can't believe that the women can do it. And the great irony of this is that throughout the centuries and across the globe, women were doing it. Um, and that, that was what was written out. They're either written out of history or they're made like someone like Granny Whale into these extraordinarily exceptional stories or they are trivialized and they're anecdotal and they're funny, amusing little side bits of history. Um, and it was really only in the 1980s. And I, I, you know, I am so um, delighted to see so many, so much great historical work has been done since the 1980s. Um, that I think I was really the first person to put them all together in a, in a collection and to say there's something really important here about women's relationship to warfare, women's relationship to conflict, but also how they have been written out of history and the significance of that. How did women enter into the culture of combat? Like I'm wondering why a woman would risk her home, her reputation and possibly her life to enlist as a soldier disguised as a man um, back then. Um, I mean, we can see the attraction of the freedom of piracy when we listened about Bonnie and Reed and Grace as well. Um, like one, how did they get away with it? And two, what were the difficulties they faced compared to their male counterparts? Um, those are all great questions. Um, yes. uh, well, first of all, I should say that one of the things that I do in my, in my new book is that I really distinguish between these different categories of women in warfare, because one category, interestingly, are the wives, because if you think about, for example, during the 18th century, these, there are these long trains, um, there were always women, there were families, there were family on royal, families on Royal Navy ships, for example. So the women are there and sometimes they literally, their husband has fallen in battle and they pick up the sword or they are there and they make that transference from uh, being a wife or even being a widow and there are all sorts of jobs that those women are fulfilling from being lawn dresses to supplying the food. Um, some, sometimes they're merchants. Sometimes they are also uh, trading in equipment. So they make that transference from those positions to actually being warriors, to being combatants. So that's one category. And then there's another category, which is, um, as you mentioned, the women who disguise themselves as men and go off. And so why would a woman do that? Well, one of the reasons why they do it is that you have lots of examples and one of them would be Christian Davies who was a Dublin publican. Her husband goes, you know, this is a, a late uh, um, uh, 17th century, early 18th century story. So her husband disappears, um, but she's running the pub, they've got children and she goes off to look for him. And uh, she doesn't find him for 13 years. <laughs> um, so you, you, you get the impression there where, where very often these women, that's the kind of cover story. I'm going with my husband or I'm going to look for my husband. 
And in Christian Davies' case, when she does find him, she says, actually, I'm quite enjoying this, this, this uh, career as a warrior. So you and I shall live as brothers until the end of the campaign. And that's what they, they, they do, except that she gets found out and then she has to go in back to her sort of the, the day job, as it were, um, being a laundress. Um, so there, there are lots of examples of that where it's almost like there's a kind of accidental transference. Um, and then there are other cases, for example, during the American Civil War, there were at least 400 women who were fighting as combatants. Um, and one of the cases that I talk about quite a lot is a woman named Sarah Emma Edmonds. And I should say, even though there were 400 of them, there were really only two who wrote up their stories. And this is really significant because Anne was talking about the difficulties of actually finding documents for these women. Very, very few of them actually left their story and certainly very few of them left their stories written in their own words. But Sarah Emma Edmonds was one of them. And Sarah Emma Edmonds uh, grew up on a farm in Canada in New Brunswick. And one of the things that she talks about is she talks about how she's growing up on the farm and she and her brother are doing exactly the same job. And she notices that, um, you know, there's lots of perks to being a boy, but she's just as strong and just as able as, as, as he is. Um, her father tries to marry her off to, to, to someone, she's having none of it. So she runs away and, and she adopts this male name. She becomes Franklin Thompson. And as Franklin Thompson, she becomes a Bible salesman, which is, I just love that irony, but anyway, she has girlfriends um, uh, as she's earning her own money. And this is one of those things that, again, we can think about Granuel, a woman earning her own money in the 19th century is huge. It's just huge. Independence is huge. You get to determine your own destiny. So Sarah, as Franklin, uh, goes across the border, happens to be in Michigan, the American Civil War breaks out, and what does she do in order to protect her disguise? She enlists with the first, uh, I think it's the first Flint Regiment. Anyway, so she goes off and um, she's actually working as a nurse, but as a man. And she, she manages to maintain her disguise for quite some time. And there is one, one of the, the things that I found in the archives uh, when I was researching this story was that she had a friend and he kept this diary and, th and these two become very, very close friends. And he often describes how Franklin came and spent the night in his tent and how they had this sort of passionate friendship. And, you know, they were both quite religious. They went to services together and they worked on shifts together. And then there's one passage where you come to this diary and the pages are glued together. So you open up these glued pages and it says written at the top, not to be opened until after the author's death. And you open it up and it says, my friend Franklin is a woman. Oh. And it was just, it was as, it's like an astonishing thing to find, but even more astonishing was that this, that, you know, that Franklin's friend, um, you know, he was most upset by the fact that he felt, he felt conned. He felt really oh. foolish that he hadn't figured it out. Um, but nothing about, well, what's this woman doing here? I mean, the other thing about that period um, during the American Civil War was that you also had someone like Rosetta Wakeman who is actually um, killed, but she too had been living as a man. Um, as she had been working on, um, I think she, she'd been working on a boat um, and she enlisted a bit like uh, Sarah Emma Edmonds, um, because it was a way of maintaining her disguise, but she also talks about um, how wonderful it was to have her own money, how wonderful it was to be um, able to determine her own destiny. So I'm sorry, this is kind of a long way around to say, <laughs> but these are all the reasons I think that women, that women did this. And then there's also a category of women, I mean, particularly there's a lot of 19th century sailors uh, where women talk about either being pressed um, mm -hmm. by a relative, a lot of them are doing it because um, uh, they're earning, again, they're earning money. Um, it was a way to travel. It was a way to maintain, uh, you know, if they were, if they were traveling, it was a way, may, a way to mean to be protected by taking on a male mm -hmm. identity. But you also have someone like Mary Lacey. So Mary Lacey is an 18th century shipwright. Mm -hmm. She's also one of the few women who actually leaves an account. And she was a domestic servant um, in Kent. Uh, she's, about 16 years old and she decides that she's actually a bit bored with being a domestic servant. She doesn't go into great detail about this um, 
in her memoir, uh, but she just leaves one day and she manages to find a pair of trousers. So she takes the trousers and she takes the shirt and off she goes, she goes down towards Portsmouth and uh, she meets a man along the road and she says, I'm looking for work. And he says, well, go, go, you know, go towards the harbor. And um, I know they're, they're looking for sailors. And that's actually how she begins her career. And, um, you know, she's also disguised, maintains that disguise. But at one point she goes home to her family in Kent. There's a family friend that she meets and the family friend ends up in Portsmouth, this woman uh, who she, um, who becomes her landlady. And the landlady knows her secret and then starts to threaten her. Oh, blackmail. Yeah. Yes. But, but, the, but the wonderful ending to Mary Lacey's story is that after she uh, leaves uh, Portsmouth, she also suffered from arthritis. And again, Anne mentions the terrible conditions aboard mm -hmm. the ship. So you can imagine for someone who suffered from arthritis, it was terrible. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, she manages to maintain her, her disguise until she gets her shipwright's ticket and she comes to London and she becomes a master builder. Right. Um, and uh, as a woman, um, and she builds a row of houses in Deptford and they're still there. Oh, wow, so, I'm gonna have to check them out. <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't aware of that part, uh, but okay. Uh, I mean, I was shocked, but yet not as well to find out that women have only been able to apply for all roles in the British Navy and military since 2018. Yes. What jobs up till then were they not deemed fit for? Because obviously, clearly, they, they were, but what, yeah. what jobs may not yeah. be? Well, I think the British military, like many other militaries around the world, have had a great concern and reticence about women uh, having any position that, that uh, gained them access to combat. So, I mean, for example, during the Second World War, uh, the women who were part of the ACAC um, brigades, who were, you know, they were, they were actually sort of, you know, helping um, uh, the gunners. Mm -hmm. um, so they were in active combat, but they had to define as being something other than inactive combat. Um, so even though the women are, were often sort of effectively on the front line um, under fire, they had to be deemed to be, to be uh, something other than active combatants. And I think that this gets maybe to the heart of um, the issue about uh, women, in, women in war and women in conflict is that there's a still, I think even now, a still a great discomfort around that. And where that begins to break down, for example, is when you have um, shortages of labor. So I, I did, um, want to talk a bit about the um, the Russian women because we haven't talked about the no. women we, yet. And <laughs> sorry, we'll do that now. Actually, um, if Shahira could share the screen with us, please. Um, we'll have a look at a few of the women because I'm mindful again of the time. But um, yeah, we'll have a look, and you can tell us just a little bit about each of these women that you've chosen. Okay, well, this this is uh, Marina Yurlova, and I was mentioning, for example, the um, the the origin of the myth of the Amazons, and it was these Scythian women who came around from the air from the air of the Black Sea, and Marina Yurlova is a 20th century, a descendant of these very women. Uh, she was a Cossack, and again, her story is kind of typical because her father was an officer, and in 1914, uh, she's at, in their little village. Her father is going off to war. It's the beginning of the First World War. She is there and she actually literally stumbles onto a train um, and goes off to, you know, it, you know, she's a teenager, she's 14 years old. Um, and so she ends up in um, a military camp and, um, you know, she can't find her father. So, and she can't get back either. Um, so uh, she's, she's taken under, uh, one of the officers take her, takes her under the wing, trains her, she uh, uh, occupies a position as a kind of groom. Um, and she, she serves for three years, she's wounded. Um, and eventually she is able to make her way out of Russia. And the reason why we know about her story is because uh, she goes, she makes her way to the United States and you can see this very glamorous picture. She That's married a filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> she marries a very famous American filmmaker. Oh, okay. Yeah, she looks like a movie star right there. Yeah, she does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can we have the next one, please? Thank you. Uh, sorry, this, this is also uh, Marina, oh, Marina Yulova, and this is her coming off the ship um, after she's 
emigrated. I mean, and I should say that that during the First World War, there are a great number of Russian women who, who fought. And some of them um, actually peti petitioned the Tsar uh, to join the army because they were enamored of the story of um, uh, Nadezhda Darova, who was a 19th century cavalry officer who also wrote her story. Um, and uh, she, which was called The Cavalry Maiden, it was published in 1836. And a section of it was first published by Pushkin. And Marie, uh, Nadezhda Darova is a wonderful story because she was taken up in the late 19th century as a kind of heroine um, for schoolgirls. There was a whole series of fictionalized stories about her. And what I found in, in um, uh, I have to say, the, um, there was a suffrage magazine that used to um, report about Russia and these cases of these Russian women who had petitioned the Tsar to serve. And a lot of them actually cited Nadezhda Darova as their kind of um, descendant. And they said, well, you know, this is what Nadezhda Darova did. And so we, we proved that Russian women can go off and fight. Um, I think uh, we have, sorry, we have a, maybe, I think it's an English woman next. Uh, okay. So this is Colonel Barker. So Colonel Barker um, is uh, quite a different case because she never actually fought. I mean, she was actually a land girl um, during the First World War, um, but she had this kind of quite extraordinary career after the war where she disguised herself as Colonel Barker. Uh, she married another woman in um, a Brighton church in, I think it was 1927. And she eventually got found, found out as it were, um, because uh, she, there was a bankruptcy charge against her, but she organized a club for the, for the uh, survivors of Battle of the Mons. Um, and, uh, and uh, she also joined the, she's, she's a bit of a complicated heroine, that's for sure, because she also joined the National Fascisti um, and was, was uh, doing boxing training with them. And then, then eventually she sort of slides into this some um, very strange existence where you can see here, this is Blackpool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this is after her big trial. And this, this case was absolutely huge because it's run, it was run the same year that um, Radcliffe Hall's The Well of Loneliness um, was uh, that, that censorship case occurred. And so there were a lot of comparisons made between the two. And in fact, Radcliffe Hall even commented on Colonel Barker um, in a not very positive way, I have to say. Um, <laughs> but the reason why, why I wrote about her was because she had sort of adopted this mantle of the warrior and, and you know, it was, all, it was all pretense, but it actually had come from some, the same kind of frustration that a lot of women felt during the First World War that they wanted to do a whole lot more than they were able to do. You were allowed to do, fair enough. And I think we, again, we have one more, an, another English woman. Yeah, this is, um, this is Flora Sands, who's, who's really, I, I'd have to describe her as Anglo-Irish or, Irish, uh, Irish English, um, uh, and she wanted to become a nurse during the First World War, like, and also actually like um, uh, Valerie Arkell Smith, who was Colonel Barker, um, they had both applied to join the Voluntary Aid Detachment during the First World War in 1914, they were turned down. So Flora Sands actually went off with um, the, Red the Red Cross to Serbia, um, nursed during um, a typhus epidemic, and, it, and her story is really remarkable because she went off to a place called Kraguyevats, where people were sort of dying by their dozens. She only had first aid training and um, she was doing surgery um, <laughs> because there was nobody else because all the surgeons had died. Mm -hmm. And she was a really, she was quite remarkable because not only did she do all of that and serve Serbia in that capacity, but in 1915, she was working as a nurse. She was attached to a regiment and a commanding officer turned around and said, well, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're having to retreat into Albania. You've got a choice here. You can either stay on as a nurse or you can come with us. But if you come with us, you have to be a soldier. And she said, that's absolutely fine with me. And she stayed in the Serbian army for seven years. Wow. And one of the reasons why she's so significant <laughs> in terms of thinking, you know, the history of um, women's participation in, in warfare, particularly during the First World War, is that she would go home on leave back to England and she would raise money. And 
this postcard that we see here was one of her means of raising money for for the Serbians. And then she would go she would go back to Serbia with medical supplies and jam and balaclavas. And uh, you know she served with them um, right until the end of the war. But she was also made an she was you know, made an officer wounded twice, quite severely. Um, and then continued to serve in Serbia and married a Russian who was a fellow officer um, and then uh, came back to England only after he had died during the Second World War. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm aware that we're sort of coming near the time. Um, we have some questions and I have a couple more questions for you. Um, so I'll move on to that. Sorry, I have to leave out the last lady there, last woman. Um, and I just wanted to say, um, like this, like just looking at the chat that's going on there um, as well, people saying, I've never heard this before as a man, somebody was saying he's, he never read about these in his history. Um, <clears throat> we, we all love a rebel, but is there a negative side to being held up then as an icon and a role model, do you think? Just if we look at the way Grace is described in British records, um, and look at the way women, um, prominent women, still get trolled and still, you know, today, compared to men on social media. Um, what's my question here, really? Like, how many more of these stories do you think have been erased or hidden? And, you know, why are we so hard on, on these women as well? Uh, who wants to answer that? Either one. Well, in the 16th century, you know, there were other uh, powerful women, and indeed I wrote a biography of one, and unlike Grace O'Malley, folklore did not keep her memory alive, and that was the great Eleanor Countess of Desmond, I refer to as the, uh, as the Hecuba of the Tudor Wars. Now, what that woman did, uh, again, in, in a terrible uh, situation and funny enough Grace O'Malley it was her it was this woman's husband who imprisoned Grace O'Malley in Askeaton it was amazing how both their lives uh, um, crossed over and she was written out and I think perhaps the reason why maybe in Ireland is that she has the word countess before her name you know now where Grace O'Malley was concerned funny enough the poets of Ireland who were banned in the succeeding centuries from naming Ireland in their poems because the English authorities felt that that was akin to a rebellion. So they choose names of women. And one of them, funny enough, was Grace O'Malley, Grania Whale. There are many, many poems asking Ireland to rise up against English uh, rule, all of that. And they use Grace O'Malley, who I'm sure would have a big loud laugh at the, at the outcome of that. But you know, that's how she was used, her name, to, for totally different reasons in this in the uh, uh, the proceedings or the centuries following. Julie, how do you see these sharing of stories um, as empowering to women and girls in the school? Because you've you've talked about uh, that. Yeah, well, it was it was funny because I was reading um, uh, Diane Allen's wonderful book Forward today, and um, oh, sorry, Forewarned, sorry. Um, and one of the things she talks about is. Um, you know, being a bit of a tomboy and that was me and and I think that if I had had access to these kind of stories I would really have related to them and I think they might have broadened my horizons and I think that what these women do is that they tell us that women's lives are much richer and much more complex and much more deeply embedded in our our understanding of what history is, particularly around wars, which are so significant. I mean, you know, I'm of the generation, both of my parents were deeply affected by the Second World War. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of trying to find your place in that as a woman is often very difficult. And yet it shouldn't be because there are all these extraordinary things that women were, were doing um, and, and actually have sort of left, left off this, this legacy of, you know, there's so much more that women are capable of doing than I think that than we've previously been led to believe. Shahira, do you have any questions from the chat that you might have picked out there while we've been talking? Um. Yeah, there's quite a few, but I think they've all, well, most of them have been duplicated in the Q&A, if you want to have a look there. Okay. Um, one of the questions from Abby Matthews is, did she raise, talking about Grace, did she raise her children on ships, on her ships? No, what happened with the children of Gaelic aristocracy, they were absolutely always 
uh, certainly of chieftains, they were fostered out. The mother would have them for about three or four years, and then they were fostered out because that bound the fosterer to the, the family of the child. And it was all a very much part of that political situation there. So Grace's sons, and uh, well, particularly her two sons, would have, been, or, uh, would have been fostered out. Her three sons would have been fostered out. Uh, but they certainly did follow in her footsteps, you know, uh, Tippett Nalong took over her, her galleys towards the end of her life, uh, towards the 1600s. And he is very much prominent and he's called Toby of the ships. So he was the one who followed in her footsteps for a number of years uh, before, of course, everything to do with shipping then after the fall of the old Gaelic order that was all swept away as well. Thank you. There's a, a question here from Rosemary. Um, is piracy symptomatic of poverty? Hmm. I think it's symptomatic of political unrest on land, and you see that everywhere. And it's not so much piracy. As I said earlier, piracy and plundering, you have to be very careful when you talk about that in relation to a maritime community. The flotsam and jetsam of the sea was always considered part and parcel of every maritime community from Cornwall to the South China Seas to the west coast of Ireland. Julie, um, something you mentioned earlier as well about um, the recent court case, this uh, to do with them, to do with the British and uh, military. What was that? Uh, well, well, um, uh, uh, Diane, yeah. uh, Diane Allen, who who I mentioned, a retired uh, lieutenant colonel, um, was actually just. Uh, La I think it was last week, um, uh, appearing before um, a parliamentary defense committee and talking about this, this problem um, of um, women still not feeling uh, comfortable, still not feeling uh, at ease, um, really high dropout rates, really high rates of sexual harassment. Um, and so, you know, th 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 which suggests to me that, you know, um, we still really, feel very uncomfortable. I mean, or a lot of men or a lot of male institutions, male dominated institutions still feel uncomfortable about having women in positions of leadership and power. And yet the irony is that only when women do attain those um, positions of leadership and power are things going to change. Okay, I mean, to both of you this one, I just wondered if part of that, uh, the fear that if you allow them in, it and like women can do it too. Does that take away from the sort of like hero thing that like men going off to war um, and this is a male preserve and like only we can come home and we're heroes. Do you think it takes a shine off that a little bit if women can do it too? Is that part of it? Or am women I just being hard? <laughs> women have always done it. Yes. It's just a matter of perception. That would be my argument. And I think where Grace O'Malley was concerned, I always think that her second husband, uh, the Mac William of Mayo, that was the highest title in the area, he was a fantastic New Age man, really. He never lost his standing in among the male chieftains, his contemporaries, because his wife was doing such an unusual for the time and such a dangerous and such a dramatic, had such a dramatic role. And the two of them together were a formidable couple. And I think there's something, you know, we can't, I think uh, that the women are beginning to find themselves and have done now, and particularly in this century, against a lot of, of odds. But I think we also have to say to the men, you know, they're with us. Uh, most of them are with us in this. Mm -hmm. And I think it, things are changing in a very, very uh, positive way for women. Now, we have all the horror stories that will always occur, no matter what century you're in, you will always have that. But I think there is, there has been a great improvement and women have made great strides in relative recent times. And I think that we're only starting. We need more people like yourselves as well, digging these histories up for us and finding out about these marvelous women. Um, okay, I'm, I'm kind of, we're slightly over the time, but uh, just wanted to ask a couple more questions if that's okay and if everybody's still there. Um, from uh, Column, is the gift of the handkerchief, I know this story, is the gift of the handkerchief from the queen true? 
<laughs> we would love it to be, of course, but no, there is no, I found nothing in the state papers to say that, you know, they met as old women, you know, so they sat down like experienced women who had been up against it really all their life. There were both women very much in a male dominated society and in a male world. And they sat down and the highlight of my research was finding that letter from Queen Elizabeth and you know what she says, there was a little bit of um, sisterly competition there because both of them were the same age and there was only a difference in their complexion that one wore a lot of makeup and the other didn't. The furrows and, and lashes of the, the sea was possibly visible on Grace O'Malley's face. And Elizabeth writes in the letter from the meeting to tell Bingham to have pity on this poor aged woman who came to me. You know, both of them were the same age. So I can tell you there was a little bit of competition there somewhere along the line. OK, listen, we get lots of uh, support for you for both your talks tonight. Um, a really interesting to everybody in the chat and anyone asking questions. If you get in touch with us at learning at RMG, we can answer more of your questions. Um, if Anne, if you just like to say the name of your book again on Grace for everybody. Well, it's Grace O'Malley, the biography of Ireland's Pirate Queen, 1530-1603 by Gill Books. Fab. And Julie as well, your book, the last one. Um, yeah, it's called Sisters in Arms, uh, Female Warriors from Antiquity to the New Millennium. Thank you both so, so much. Um, I mean, one hour is not enough to cover just the parts that we're talking about tonight. And I'd like to say to everybody watching, please do tune in next week for the last of our program in this series, Female Pirates, with an added twist. It's Women of Pirate Radio. The speakers are DJ uh, Debbie Gold, and she's a radio host and broadcaster for Resonance Radio, plus Anne GD and Carmela Obian. Uh, thanks again to Anne Chambers and Dr. Julie Wheelwright. Uh, people are loving you guys. And thanks to Shahira and to everybody for zooming in. And thank you, Elma and Anne and Shahira. It was great. Lovely to see you all. And from Dublin, Sloan and keep safe. Sloan to yourself and goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye.